Thank you for inviting me to reflect with you on the topic, Journeying from Life to Death and Eternal Life. You know, I presuppose that you are doing this as a fitting spiritual preparation for your participation in the Paschal Triduum of the Church. In the next three days, we will try to go deep into the spirit of the three most important celebrations in the liturgical life of the Church. Firstly, the Holy Thursday Mass of the Lord's Supper. Secondly, the Good Friday commemoration of the Lord's Passion and Death. And thirdly, the Vigil Mass of the Lord's Resurrection. Well, for day one, you have asked me to reflect with you on the journey, the topic of journey through life for day two on the journey through death, and for day three, the journey through resurrection to eternal life. Life, death, eternal life. Let us refer to them as the three stages of the journey, our journey with Christ in His life and mission, His suffering and death on the cross, and His resurrection. Let us now start with day one, the journey through life. Here, we will try to relate the journey through life with the Mass of the Lord's Supper. St. Mark tells us, The disciples had come to Jerusalem with Jesus to celebrate the Passover, which in Hebrew is Pesach and in Spanish is Pasqua. It is the feast commemorating the liberation of the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt. They ritualized this event in their history by coming together for a meal and reenacting their Last Supper in a state of bondage. Yes, I mean Last Supper in Egypt. Of course, for the disciples, it became eventually their Last Supper with Jesus. Kaya ang tawag natin is La Ultima Cena, ang huling hapunan. Normally, in the time of Jesus, before the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, people went to Jerusalem temple, to the Jerusalem temple, to offer a sacrificial lamb, to have it slaughtered by the priest, and then take it home for the roasting in preparation for the ritual meal that they called Seder. They ate the roasted flesh of the lamb in haste, as described in the book of Exodus with unleavened bread, which they called matzah, because they had no time to put leaven on the bread and to make it rise. That takes a little bit of time, you know. They also flavored the bread with a dip made of bitter herbs in order to recall the bitter years of their life of oppression as slaves in Egypt. And they drank wine four times, the fermented juice of grapes that had been trampled upon also to symbolize their oppression. But after the disciples gathered together on that Thursday evening in order to eat their Passover meal in a rented room in Jerusalem, the quick turn of events would lead to Jesus' betrayal by Judas, who would turn him over to the priests. Jesus' arrest and his speedy trial and condemnation to a death sentence and his crucifixion at Calvary. Later, they would look back and would try to make sense of what had happened. They would remember his words during that meal, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. Do this in memory of me. The experience would now make them understand the Passover differently, no longer as a commemoration of the Old Covenant, 
and their liberation from slavery as a people by the blood of the Lamb, but rather as a commemoration of the new covenant and liberation from Satan by his own blood. Now he becomes the Lamb himself. Judas's act of betrayal became the symbolic handing over of the Lamb to the priests for sacrifice with Jesus as victim or offering. But in the narrative of the Lord's Supper, the Gospel writers would tell us that Jesus willfully entered Jerusalem, fully aware that the priests were plotting to kill him, meaning he was not a victim. He willingly took the role not just of the lamb for the sacrifice, but also the role of the priest when he said, Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. He was not sacrificed by the priests of the temple as a victim. He willfully and consciously assumed both the roles of priest and victim, the offerer and the offering, the mediator of the covenant, and the sacrifice for that covenant. In short, he did not say, I will offer a lamb for your redemption. By speaking of feeding them with his own body and blood, he was in effect saying, I am the lamb for the sacrifice, and also the priest who makes the offering. I will offer my own life for your redemption. That is the priesthood of Christ. This was the very first Eucharist that opened the eyes of the disciples to the whole meaning of our journey through life. And we have since celebrated this Eucharist as the sacrament of love, meaning both a sign and instrument affecting what it signifies, a sacrament of love, a sacrament of God's enduring love for us in Jesus Christ. It is the one and only sacrifice worth offering in the name of Jesus Christ, in whose priesthood we all share, we the baptized. Yes, all of us, not only the ordained, the whole community of disciples that reenacts the supreme Paschal sacrifice by the way we live our lives. He teaches us how to live life as the Eucharist. You know, Jesus lived a very short earthly life. 33 years old lang siya when he was crucified. Ako, I'm now 65, close to two times the age of Jesus when he died on the cross. But even 65 is short when you come to think of it. Merong isang salmo in the Old Testament that speaks about the shortness of life. Psalm 90. I recommend that you meditate on it today. In that psalm, in verses 3 to 6, the psalmist says, You turn human beings back into dust, saying, Return, your, you children of Adam. A thousand years in your eyes are merely a day gone by. Like wild grass, they sprout in the morning. In the morning it blooms only to pass away. By evening it withers and fades. And then in verses 9 to 10, it says, our life is over like a sigh. Seventy is the number of our years, or eighty if we are strong. And most of it is empty and fruitless toil. It passes quickly, and we are gone. We do not want to live life as an empty and fruitless toil that passes and quickly is gone. And so the psalmist says, Lord, teach us to count our days aright, that we may gain wisdom of heart. And what does he mean by Lord, teach us to count our days aright? And what does he mean Lord, teach us to count our days aright, so that we will gain wisdom of heart? Actually, the psalmist has already given us a clue in verse 4. He said, A thousand years in your eyes are merely a day gone by. Meaning, one single day or one single moment can be the equivalent of a thousand years. If only we learn to live our lives well. We usually remind ourselves of this. At each time we celebrate our birthdays and do the ritual of making a wish before eating our birthday cake, diba? Right? 
I have a little confession to make. I am not very fond of the birthday cake ritual, which I find a bit morbid on account of two things. Una, the cake itself. And secondly, the candles that we light up on top of the cake. About the cake itself, there is an English expression, di ba? It says, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. I honestly do not see why the expression makes the idea of eating your cake sound so regrettable. What is the point in having a cake if not to eat it anyway? Obviously, after you eat it, you won't have it anymore. And I don't see why this should be regrettable. I actually find it Eucharistic. You cannot live a Eucharistic life if you are not ready to be consumed. The other morbid thing about the birthday cake has to do with the lighted candles that we put on top of it. Diba? We sing first a birthday song and then we ask the celebrator to blow off the lighted candles as if to remind us that soon we will be blown off ourselves. You celebrate life by being reminded, mamamatay ka rin. We are all going to die anyway, di ba? But I think the real big deal about the ritual is when you are told to make a wish before blowing off your lighted candle. I think what we're saying is a life without wishes, a life without meaning and purpose is not worth celebrating. Walang saysayang buhay na walang kahulugan at walang pinag-aalayan. Kumbaga sa palay, walang laman. Ipalang yan. Maybe that is why one of the favorite images for the final judgment is winnowing. The act of winnowing is sifting the grains from the chaff. Yun ang ginagawa ng mga magsasaka, you know. When they put the rice grains on the bilao, they throw them into the air so that the empty shells na tinatawag nating ipa are blown away and those with full and heavy grains inside will fall into the bilao. I think I now get what the song is lamenting about. When we fail to live life with meaning and purpose, it passes very quickly and most of it becomes fruitless and empty toil. Spirituality is a quest for a life with substance. We know that we are just as biodegradable as all physical reality, di ba? But if we learn to live our lives with spiritual substance, if we learn to live our physical existence in a manner that is soulful, made truly meaningful by love, care, compassion, grace, forgiveness, and sacrifice, then a moment can turn into a thousand years. Like I said, Jesus lived only for 33 years on earth, but look, 2,000 years later, He still lives with us and still lives in us. And so we are not alone in our journey through life. We have Jesus as our travel companion, the God who became human so that He could walk with humans and teach us humans how to walk with one another towards a common destination which is beyond this world and which we usually call heaven. Pero you know, there is something that we fail to appreciate about the meaning of heaven as our destination. Kasi we tend to dismiss life in this world as nothing but a valley of tears. We tend to speak pejoratively of life in this world as fallen and sinful, parang napaka-negative, we tend to think of human life as a dichotomy of body and soul, physical and spiritual, and project heaven as a reward for disembodied souls after we die, and salvation as a liberation from this world which we equate with mortality, sinfulness, weakness, vulnerability. Ay nako, we tend to forget that God created this world and our physical reality and He saw that it was good and that God created human life in His image and likeness. Jesus corrects our mistaken views about this world and about human life. How can we hope in a hereafter 
if we have not taken the here and now seriously. It is wrong to aspire for heaven almost as an escape from our miserable lives on earth. I find this very, very clear in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Tinatawag natin siyang, you know, uh, the Lord's Prayer. But actually, I prefer to treat it as the vision and mission statement of the Lord. The prayer comes in two parts. The first part has three petitions addressed to God in heaven. The second part, three petitions pertaining to us on earth, our needs on earth. But the middle part is the summary of the whole prayer. The part, the line that says, Dito sa lupa, para ng salangit, on earth as it is in heaven. To live life on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning, not to wait until after death to know what heaven is like, but to live life on earth as if heaven has already begun. That is the vision and mission statement of Jesus. It is correct to aspire for heaven, but we must start it on earth. Therefore, we say, may your name be hallowed. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. Saan? Where? On earth. Dito sa lupa. Dito sa lupa. That if we hallow God's name, if we let God's kingdom come, if we let God's will be done among us on earth, then heaven would have begun. Jesus has never portrayed heaven as an escape from this world. Heaven is not like a pie in the sky when you die or an opium that will make us forget our miserable lives in this world. No, we don't live life in this world only to be miserable. You will not find a faith more realistic than Christianity, you know. It makes us confront the challenges of life head on. It teaches us never to run away from them, never to treat heaven as an escape from the earth. It also reminds us to prioritize three of our most basic needs on earth. One, to find our proper source of nourishment. Give us this day our daily bread. And that daily bread is not just the food for our stomachs. Kasi pwedeng busog ang tiyan pero gutom ang kaluluwa. Not just the food that nourishes the body, but also the food that nourishes the spirit. And that is the word of God. That we be constantly reminded that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And what comes after give us this day our daily bread? We say, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So we pray also for forgiveness. Because we suffer a lot on earth. We suffer a lot on earth because uh, we will somehow get by if we learn to live with imperfections and failures by having the humility to seek forgiveness when we are wrong or to be forgiving when others do wrong. Finally, we must also learn to deal with temptations by discerning the ways of the evil one if we really want to aspire for deliverance. Let us wind this up now. To journey with Jesus is to walk with a God who is love as revealed to us in Jesus Christ. It is with Christ as companion in the journey that we discover that without love, without a love that is willing to give up one's life for the beloved, without love that's ready for the sacrifice, life is not worth living. It has no meaning that only love can give it substance, like a full grain that is ready to fall and die in order to bear much fruit. I therefore want to end this reflection with the words of a song that speaks about the three moments in life, the morning, the noontime, and the evening of life. I am sure you're familiar with that old liturgical song entitled, Did I Fill the World with Love? Or Fill the World 
with love. Ganito yung sinasabi ng kanta. First, in the morning, in the morning of my life, I shall look to the sunrise. At the moment in my life when the world is new. And the blessing I shall ask is that God will grant me to be brave and strong and true and to fill the world with love my whole life through. And then, the noontime. In the noontime of my life, I shall look to the sunshine at a moment in my life when the sky is blue. And the blessing I shall ask shall remain unchanging to be brave and strong and true and to fill the world with love my whole life through. And finally, the evening of life. It says, in the evening of my life, I shall look to the sunset. At a moment in my life when the night is due. And the question I shall ask, only God can answer. Was I brave and strong and true? And did I fill the world with love my whole life through? Brothers and sisters, I do not know at what moment you are in your life right now. Is it the morning? Is it the noontime? Or is it the evening for you? But the question remains the same. Are we filling the world with love our whole lives through? That is what Jesus, our travel companion, is inviting us to discover in our journey through life. In the morning of my life, I shall look to the sunrise. At a moment in my life when the world is new. And the blessing I shall lost is that God will grant me to be brave and strong and true. And to fill the world with love And to fill the world with love And to fill the world with love My whole life through In the noontime of my life I shall look to the sunshine at a moment in my life when the sky is blue And the blessing I shall lost will remain unchanging To be brave and strong and true To fill the world with love, and to fill the world with love, and to fill the world with love, my whole life through.
Today, Good Friday, we will try to go deep into the spirit of our commemoration of the Lord's passion and death. By joining Jesus spiritually in his journey to Calvary, by reflecting on his suffering and death on the cross, we will try to confront the most daunting aspects of our journey through life, our own struggles with our own mortality, the reality of suffering and dying. What does it mean to journey through life in this world with eternal life as our destination, but with passion and death as the itinerary? There are two things that often make it difficult for us to deal with the reality of death. One, the suffering that might go with it. And two, the pain of the thought of being separated from the ones we love. Let's start with the first, suffering. I have heard this from many people. Sometimes they say to me, you know, Bishop, I really have no problem accepting that I will die. It's the thought that it might be preceded by a prolonged suffering that I am afraid of. And that's why I pray to God that my death be quick and peaceful. Coming aho in our night prayers, the concluding blessing says, May the Lord grant us a restful night and a peaceful death. Every day, we pray for a peaceful death. Someone else told me when I told him to read the passion narratives in order to overcome his fear of death. Sagot ba naman niya, Sorry, Bishop, but Christ's violent death on the cross is not a very reassuring example that can help us deal with death. Why? Why did he have to suffer so much? We can accept suffering as a fact of life, especially when suffering is caused by illness or old age or natural disasters or, or even accident. We can also accept suffering as a punishment or as a consequence of our own wrongdoings. But it is the suffering of people who have not done anything wrong that is usually hard to accept the undeserved suffering of innocent people. There are more laments in the book of Psalms, you know, than sounds of praise. The Jewish people themselves had to deal with this issue of undeserved suffering. For example, Psalm 22 is a lament that Jesus himself supposedly prayed or recited while he was hanging on the cross. Now we know it as one of the seven last words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my call for help, from my cries of anguish? My God, I call by day, but you do not answer. I call by night, but I have no relief. And then in verse 15, the psalmist says, Like water, my life drains away. All my bones are disjointed. My heart has become like wax. It melts away within me. There are even some lines in the psalm composed more than five centuries before Christ that are almost describing in detail the crucifixion of Jesus. Like in verses 17 to 18, the psalmist says, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they even cast lots. Suffering is aggravated by our inability to make sense of it. Mahirap na ngang magdusa pero mas Matindi ang pagdurusang walang kahulugan pag hindi natin mabigyan o mahanapan ng kahulugan. And that's the prevailing tone, for example, in the book of Job. Job's lament can be simplified into one question. Lord, 
What did I do to deserve this misery? Sabi ko nga, we usually have no problem accepting suffering when we have when we know that we have done something wrong. But it is when we know that we are innocent, that we are tempted to ask God, Lord, why do good people have to suffer? It's unfair. And it begins to put our faith into crisis the way it put Job into crisis. Christianity has found the answer to the issue of seemingly undeserved suffering by reading reading Isaiah chapter 53, the idea of redemptive suffering. Sometimes we suffer not because we have done anything wrong or because we are being lit. Sometimes we suffer not because we have done anything wrong or we're being punished, but rather because we have made a conscious choice to love unconditionally and to make ourselves ready for the consequences of our choice. Let us read from Isaiah chapter 53. In verses 4 to 5, the prophet says, Yet it was our pain that he bore. It was our sufferings that he endured. We thought of him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquity. He bore the punishment that makes us whole. By his wounds, we were healed. And in verse 11, the prophet says, My servant, the just one, shall justify the many, and their iniquity he shall bear. Well, ito ho ang pinagmulan ng the idea of substitute suffering. Suffering as a willful choice of a lover for the redemption of his beloved. It is actually the foundation of the theology of the cross. We often mistakenly reduce the cross itself into a symbol of suffering. And I say mistakenly because in doing this, we end up glorifying suffering which is not Christian. We end up promoting a kind of pathological behavior that verges into masochism or even sadism. Without Christ, the cross is nothing but a horrible instrument of torture. And that is the reason why it took some time before the early Christians began to use the cross as a symbol of redemption. It was no different from other methods of execution, like the garrote that was used for the gomburza, or the firing squad for Jose Rizal's execution, or the electric chair for people convicted of heinous crimes just a few decades ago in the Philippines before we got rid of the death penalty law. What the cross of Christ is symbolizing for us is love, love, unconditional love, Love that is ready for suffering and death for the sake of the beloved. The cross is never to be equated with the absurdity and meaninglessness of the unthinkable forms of violence committed by human beings against their fellow human beings. The suffering and death symbolized by the cross is positive. It is empowering and it is salvific. St. Paul is saying this. In the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, in verse 18, St. Paul declares, The message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Then in verse 23, he also says, We proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called Jews and Greeks alike, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God stronger than human strength. 
And so, as disciples, as followers of the way of Christ, we are invited today to unite our sufferings with the suffering of Christ. If we want to know how to give meaning to them. By uniting ourselves with Christ in his way of the cross, our sufferings become means for redemption. They become the way to eternal life. St. Paul also explains how he himself has drawn from the cross of Christ the strength to be able to endure all forms of sufferings. And he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not constrained. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We are always caring about, in the body, the dying of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. St. Peter also says this. In his first letter, in chapter 4, verse 13, he says, But rejoice to the extent that you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice exultantly. And now for the second reason why we are afraid of death. And that is the suffering that it causes on the ones departing and on those who are being left behind. And we call it grief. Grieving is a terrible experience. You know, the Italian writer Carlo Rovelli, in his book entitled The Order of Time, speaks about the positive meaning of grieving. Rovelli says, It is not absence that causes sorrow or grieving. It is affection. It is love. Without affection, without love, such absences would cause us no pain. For this reason, even the pain caused by absence is in the end something good and something beautiful because it feeds on that which gives meaning to life. So how can we know sorrow if we have not known joy? How can we grieve if we have not love? Grieving is a positive thing. Only people who have love can grieve. No wonder Jesus says in his farewell address, his goodbye speech in John chapter 16, verse 20, he says, Amen, amen, I say to you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn into joy. And then he uses the image of a woman in labor, isang babaeng nagbubuntis at malapit ng mga anak. In John 16, verse 21, he says, When a woman is in labor, she is in anguish because her hour has arrived. But when she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the pain because of her joy that the child has been born into the world. You see, for us Christians, grief is a mere prelude to joy. And so, what does journeying through death entail? Let me digress a little bit. There is a very strange kind of devotion that seems to be very popular among Mexicans. It is being practiced by some Catholics in that country, but it does not seem to have anything to do with the Catholic Christian tradition. I am talking about the popular religious veneration of an icon called Santa Muerte. And literally, it means holy death. Santa Muerte. Let me make it immediately clear that there is no such saint or santa in the Catholic roster of saints. So, sa magaling to, where is it coming from? Well, your guess is as good as mine. The typical icon of Santa Muerte is particularly shocking to the normal sensibilities. It is that of a skeleton, may bungo, with the same kind of vestments which images of saints are dressed up with, sometimes even those associated with the Blessed Mother. Sa totoo lang, you know, 
the first time I saw Santa Muerte images in the little chapels in Tijuana, in Mexico, close to the border between Mexico and the United States in San Diego, California. I was very shocked to see the morbid image of Santa Muerte dressed in garment, garments associated with the Virgen del Guadalupe. I saw some devotees stopping by the chapel and even making a sign of the cross. And it, it made me shiver. It actually seems to be more of an occult practice that is not even endorsed by the Mexican bishops. But they could not stop it. Alas, even bishops have no control of some popular devotions. Is it possible that a missionary who wasn't so good at explaining theology probably spoke to them about the icon of the Santo Entierro or the Santo Sepulcro de Cristo, the holy burial or the holy sepulcher of Christ? Maybe they talked about it as the Santa Muerte de Jesus, the holy death of Jesus. Is it possible that, you know, the natives who listened retained only half of what they had said and related it to some indigenous cult about muerte, about death? Could it, could it have gone wayward precisely because they forgot to attach it to our commemoration of the passion and death of the Lord on Good Friday? Is it possible that a meditation on the image of the dead Jesus was originally promoted as part of the faithful's preparation for the celebration of the Dia de los Muertos for the Mexicans, which is All Souls Day for us. Ang undas natin, araw ng mga patay. Actually, this is the case in Pampanga, you know, where there is a very strong devotion to the Santo Entierro. Meron din kami ng version niyan sa Bangkulasi na botas. And the icon uh, that is, you know, uh, that is revered is endearingly called in Pampanga, Apo Mamakalulu. And literally, Apo Mamakalulu means the Lord who bestows mercy, the merciful Lord. It is the Kapampangan version of the divine mercy. And it is a devotion that is actually much, much older than the Divine Mercy promoted by Sister Faustina Kowalska. The Feast of Apu Mamakalulu, or Santo Entierro, is celebrated on a Friday that is the closest to the commemoration of, of the Beloved Departed on November 2. But unlike the Divine Mercy icon, which is that of the resurrected Christ appearing to the disciples in the upper room, our Kapampangan Santo Entierro, or the Apu Mamakalulu icon, is that of the dead Christ being prepared for burial in a borrowed tomb, probably inspired by Luke chapter 23, verses 50 to 56. It is also about the holy death. You can say Santa Muerte, but unlike the Mexican version, it is exclusively about the redeeming death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, because the Santo Entierro is not about, about death personified, like the Grim Reaper of the West, and who is venerated as a female saint in Mexico. I suspect that the Santa Muerte devotion is founded on a superstition that if they pray and make offerings to Santa Muerte, they can appease the Grim Reaper and beg her not to come too soon to claim their loved ones from them. Well, there is nothing Christian about that. On the day we commemorate our departed one, the church invites the living to reflect on death and what it is supposed to mean to us as Christians. And I think that is also what we do on Good Friday. We are being invited to see our own death as a participation in the death of Christ. Only in that way can we stop thinking of death as something grim and fearful, but rather as a reality that we must befriend. Kasi mamamatay din naman tayo lahat, di ba? Since we are all going to die anyway, we might as well deal with death and accept it as 
rather than struggle with it or run away from it. And the only kind of death that we should be afraid of is kamatayang walang kabuluhan, a meaningless death. If being a Christian is being part of the body of Christ, it means we are called upon to aspire for a meaningful death by uniting ourselves with the death of Christ. That's in Romans 6 verse 5. Only Christ can radically change our whole perspective on death. The only death that we call holy is the death of Jesus Christ. Why? Ibang klaseng kamatayan ito. It is a death that gives life or a life-giving death. It is a death that puts an end to the curse of death. The death of the lover gives life to the beloved. Hindi ba sinabi ni Jesus, there is no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. John 15, verse 13. And we can reformulate that and say, There is no greater love than to participate in the redeeming death of Christ that gives life to the beloved. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the ultimate paradox of the Christian faith. That we believe in a suffering and dying God in Jesus Christ. Kasi, come to think of it, how can we even talk of a dying God? If we take it for granted that God is eternal, and therefore God is immortal, meaning God cannot die. But that is precisely the mystery of incarnation. When God embraced our humanity, God also humbled himself, emptied himself, and assumed our human mortality. He did it precisely to outwit the devil, the devil who brought about the curse of sin. And the curse of sin, the scripture says, is death. Now the Son of God defeats death by redefining it, no longer as the end of life, but as the gateway to eternal life. By dying, he destroys our death, but by rising, he restores our life. There is one gospel passage that has become a favorite text for funeral masses. And it's very obvious why. I am referring to that part in John chapter 12, where Jesus is giving a positive meaning to the act of falling and dying. Falling, because usually, has a very negative meaning for Christians, as in the fall of Adam and Eve. Kasi it connotes sin. It connotes failure, kapalpakan, kasalanan. But Jesus, in John chapter 12, is turning it positive. When he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. I mentioned this to you yesterday, using the image of the palay and its distinction from the ipa. Pag tinignan mo kasi, parang pareho lang itsura nila eh. Like I told you, they look exactly the same from the outside. But there is a whole world of a difference between the palay and the ipa. The palay has a grain of bigas inside. The ipa has nothing inside. It's just an empty shell. You cannot plant ipa. Nothing will grow. But the palay has a grain. If it falls into the earth and dies, something sprouts and bears fruit. Perhaps Jesus is making us understand death this way. How can we expect to die a meaningful death if we have not even strived to live a meaningful life? Magkaugnay po ang buhay at kamatayan. It is people who have lived life with substance, may laman with meaning and purpose, who will be able to face death with courage. It is Christ who has taught us to live life in such a way that we do not fear suffering and death. That if we unite ourselves with his paschal sacrifice, the sacrament of God's unconditional love, then we can discover the suffering that heals and the death that gives life. Do we not say this in our most popular Tagalog liturgical song, Pananagutan? Walang sino man ang nabubuhay para sa sarili lamang. 
walang sino man ang namamatay para sa sarili lamang. Actually, these are borrowed words from St. Paul. In Romans chapter 14, verse 7, St. Paul says, No one lives for himself alone, just as no one dies for himself alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, it is for the Lord. And if we live or die, we belong to the Lord. I wish all of you a blessed Good Friday. Today, Black Saturday, as we prepare ourselves for the Vigil of the Lord's Resurrection, we will reflect on our final topic for this Paschal Triduum Recollection, The Journey to Eternal Life. You know, the late film director, Marilu Diaz Sabaya, became a good friend of mine and a personal mentor in media work for evangelization. She used to tell me, that she had volunteered her services to the church and media work for free because she wanted to be mentored about the sacred scriptures, especially about the story of Jesus in the Gospels, which she calls the greatest story ever told. Well, she told me as a filmmaker and a storyteller, she was convinced that there are no stories worth telling except stories of redemption, Stories with a happy ending. She also said her motto in life was, I believe in happy endings. If the story is not happy, then it's not yet the end. And I agree with her. I would have added, if the story is not happy, then it means we should continue telling it until it reaches its proper happy ending. And that is how it is with the story of Jesus. It does not end in a tomb. His story goes on because in the early morning of the day after Sabbath, what the women found was an empty tomb. Well, perhaps that is why we speak euphemistically of death as a passing. With Jesus as our companion on the journey, we realize that we're merely passing through this world. In verse 16 of John's prologue, the evangelist says, From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. But to understand what John is talking about, we have to complete the rest of the text in verse 17, which he explains how we get to receive. There he explains how we get to receive grace upon grace. And he says, because while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Only in Christ can our often tragic stories find their proper happy endings. The law of Moses was supposed to be the foundation of the covenant of Israel with God. That is why in the inner sanctum of their temple, inside the Ark of the Covenant, the Jewish people kept the two stone tablets of the law, and they had to be constantly reminded that they could become God's family only if they committed themselves to the covenant by being obedient to God's commandments. But Jesus told his fellow Jews that without love, without fidelity to the covenant, the commandments were meaningless. And so, he summarized the Ten Commandments into only two. Love God above all and love your neighbor as yourself. The same summary is given in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, in answer to the question of the scholar of the law who said, Teacher, what must I, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But there, it is the man who asks it who ends up answering the question himself by citing the two loves, the vertical and the horizontal. The vertical love, well, which is actually a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which the Jewish people call the great Shema, or the great commandment to love God above all. 
And then, of course, the horizontal line, love of neighbor as oneself, is a quotation from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. The two lines of the cross, the vertical line, love of God, and the horizontal line, love of neighbor as oneself. After Jesus affirmed him, the man posed a follow-up question. Humirit pa siya. And he was seeking now a definition of neighbor. Para bang gusto makipagdebate? Well, love of God seemed very clear to him, but it was love of neighbor that he had a problem with. And therefore, he asked, Who is my neighbor? Para bang gusto niya malaman, Can you define neighbor for me? Because the neighbor is, you know, well defined in the Jewish uh, faith, you know. Only my fellow Jews is an, you know, our neighbors. And the answer that Jesus gave him was not a law. The man was asking for law, but Jesus answered not with a law, but with a story, a parable. The parable that now became known as the Good Samaritan. And Jesus ends the story by twisting the scholar's question from who is my neighbor to which of the three was neighbor to the victim, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? And the answer of the man was the one who showed compassion. He could not even stomach the idea of saying the Samaritan because the Jews so hated the Samaritans. Meaning, the man who treated his neighbor with love without having to find out about blood relations, about ethnicity, or about religion. Well, it makes sense to me, therefore, why St. Paul says, without love, we're nothing, and that only love endures forever. No wonder, well, when he began, he began his reflection on love by admonishing the Corinthians in chapter 12, verse 31, do sa dulo, which is the tail end of chapter 12, and actually the introduction to chapter 13, he said, Strive eagerly for the greater spiritual gifts without mentioning what those spiritual gifts were. And then he proceeds to that whole chapter about love. He ends chapter 13 by finally identifying these, these spiritual gifts. Tatlo ito, sabi niya, these are three. And he actually says it at the end of chapter 13. Verse 13, he says, these three remain. And he means they are the greater spiritual gifts that he was mentioning about at the start in chapter 12, verse 31. These three remain. These are faith, hope, and love. But, he says, the greatest of these is love. The greatest gift is not faith. It's not even hope. But it's love. Because love is the foundation of both believing and hoping. There is no way a person can believe or can hope without love. Only love. Only love makes faith and hope possible. And only love endures forever. It is our guarantee to eternity. That is why the Apostle St. John says, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. And in John chapter 15, Jesus further summarizes the two commandments into one. If you remember, I mentioned that he first summarized them into two, but then finally in chapter 15, he says, but my commandment to you is only this, isa na lang. And that is, love one another as I have loved you. Please, don't put a full stop after love one another because it continues to, as I have loved you. He is the criterion. As Christ himself has loved us, so we must learn to love one another. This was his parting message at the Last Supper to his disciples. 
In the farewell address of John, in chapter 14 to 17, this was made very clear by Jesus. Yun ang kanyang habilin. That we allow ourselves to be known as His disciples only by the love that we have for each other. And the final acts of love that He does for our redemption is His death on the cross. Kaya nga, we Christians have reinvented the Jewish Passover as a journey. No longer just a journey from slavery to freedom, but from mortal life to eternal life, from humanity to divinity, from slavery to Satan, to the glorious freedom of the sons and daughters of God. Our companion in this journey is Jesus Christ, who has revealed to us the merciful face of God. The God who pitched his tent, made his dwelling place among us in order to accompany us in our journey from life to death, but also from death to eternal life, which is our real happy ending. The happy ending, however, although it is a grace, is also a choice. For some, the journey may indeed end with death, much like the empty shell of what looks like palai, like I mentioned to you yesterday, but without a grain of wheat inside or grain of palai, kung walang bigas sa loob ang palay, then it is not palay, it is ipa. That it is nothing but chaff that will fall to the ground and rot and decompose. Nothing will grow. Nothing will follow after the fall. But for those who live in Christ, this is the assurance of St. Paul. For those who have received the grace of the Holy Spirit, death becomes a mere transitioning from mortal life to eternal life. That's why he made, you know, the idea of falling no longer negative but positive in John chapter 12. You know? Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. In the prologue of the gospel, composed by the same author, in verse 12, John says, But to those who accepted him, he gave the power to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not by natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but only of God. Wow. Then I have to correct myself. It's not, you know, it's not even our choice. It's pure grace. And, and we have a term for this passage, through death to eternal life. We call it the resurrection. It was not even clear to the early disciples, what resurrection really meant. Alam nyo, you know, up to the very time of Jesus, the Jewish people were not yet united in the belief in an afterlife. Pinagtatalunan ito ng mga Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in afterlife and the Sadducees did not, you know. Because the theology or the doctrine of afterlife began to enter the Jewish worldview only around uh, the middle of the second century before Christ. And you read that in Daniel chapter 12, the book of Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 to 3. There we read, and the writer says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That's resurrection, you know? He's talking about the dead, those who sleep in the dust of the earth. He says, Many of them shall awake. But he's not saying all of them. Actually, he distinguishes between, you know, those who will awake to eternal life, while others, he says, will awake to reproach and everlasting disgrace. But then the conclusion says in verse 3, But the wise shall shine brightly like the splendor of the firmament, and those who have led many to righteousness shall be like the stars. Forever. They will be like the stars forever. In his Easter narrative, in chapter 20, John tells us the disciples did not yet understand the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Their concept of resurrection was basically, well, either the figurative idea of their 
nation's restoration as in Ezekiel chapter 37, or the literal resuscitation of dead bodies to mortal life. We have stories in the Gospels about Jesus, for example, you know, raising the dead back to mortal life. For example, the son of the widow of Nain in Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Or the daughter of Jairus in Mark chapter 5, verse 22 and following. And of course, the most familiar one for all of us is the raising of Lazarus. John chapter 11. Well, John's testimony about Jesus' resurrection is therefore very important. In chapter 20, verses 6 to 7, he tells us what Peter saw inside the tomb. If you remember, you know, um, the, the women came ahead. You know, Mary Magdalene came ahead uh, very early in the morning while it was still dark, only to find that the tomb was open. And she ran to the disciples. And then, of course, after reporting it, Simon Peter and John began to race to the tomb. And the younger disciple, you know, got there ahead. And what did he do? Well, he did not go inside the tomb yet. He waited for Peter. And then when Peter arrived, he went into the tomb. And then the writer says, he saw the burial cloths there. And the cloth that had covered his head rolled up separately. Rolled up separately. In the version of St. Luke, we read in chapter 24, verse 12, Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Then he bent down and saw the burial cloths alone. He's not mentioning about the other piece of cloth that covered the head. Then, well, he went home amazed. I think the better word is dazed, confused, no, not knowing the meaning of what was happening. He could not yet understand what was going on. You know, resurrection was far-fetched from his idea. All he was looking for was a cadaver, a dead body, and it wasn't there. The writer of the fourth gospel in chapter 20, verse 8, refers to himself as the other disciple who had arrived at the tomb first. And he mentions that, you know, after Peter, he also went in. And he saw the same thing. He saw and believed. What did he see? Well, he saw what Peter saw, meaning he saw the two pieces of cloth, the cloth that covered his body and the separately rolled the cloth that covered his head. He saw them lying there. But the body was not there. So he saw and he believed. Okay, my question is, Believed what? Let me read between the lines. Well, I think what he's thinking now is, oh, the tomb had not been robbed. Because if it had been robbed, you know, they would have taken away his body. They would not have bothered, you know, to remove those shrouds, no? And besides, the shrouds were not unrolled. They were rolled up neatly and laying there. And so, of course, he would also begin to think that the dead body has not been simply resuscitated, like that of Lazarus. Remember, the same gospel writer told the story of Lazarus earlier in chapter 11. <clears throat> well, diba, if you remember in the story about the raising of Lazarus, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. <laughs> he couldn't come out. <laughs> that is why Jesus had to command the family. And they said, unbind him. Kasi nakatali pa siya. You see, you know, that's, that's what the Jewish people did with the cadavers of their beloved departed. They would wash them first and then anoint them. And after anointing them, that's when they would start wrapping them up with linen cloth, the shroud, two pieces. The first large piece, long piece, they would, you know, use for wrapping the whole body starting with the feet and then all the way to the neck, only the neck, because the one that is going to be used to wrap the head is a separate piece, as mentioned by the Gospel of John. 
And of course, not only did they wrap them, they would tie them up like that, you know, para hindi makalag, you know, hindi makalag yung wrapping. But that's why when Jesus said, unbind him, yeah, there was no way the dead body which has been resuscitated could come out of the shroud unless they helped him. And if what was reason from you know what what was reason of Jesus or resurrected of Jesus, what was resuscitated is his mere mortal body, then he would not be able to come out of the shroud. He would need that would need some help. But John noted that the burial cloths were there, lying flat, like they had been untouched, lying flat. What does that mean? It's like, imagine the body, parang suman, you know, and then just flopping like that. It was like his body had simply dematerialized or vanished or disappeared, you know? Actually, uh, ang naiisip ko dito, yung, you know, science fiction stories where the, I, I do not, I'm trying to recall what they call it, you know, uh, yung teleportation, di ba? It's like there is a machine, you put a, uh, a living body there, and then uh, the machine is turned on, and the body is teleported to another place. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that I started thinking here, you know, because, yeah, uh, even the cloth rolled around the head was there. But it was still lying separately and still rolled. It means his physical body had not been raised in the sense of resuscitated. Something else had happened. And this would be consistent. The consistent pattern in the post-resurrection narratives of the evangelists. The evangelists would narrate how, you know, whenever he appeared, he would also disappear. And he appeared to the disciples in the upper room. You read about that in John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. He appeared even if the doors were locked, meaning he didn't pass through the door or he just materialized in front of them, and yet they were able to touch him. He appeared to two disciples at Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. They did not recognize him. He walked with them, talked to them, you know, and even warmed their hearts with the word of God, with the scriptures, but they still could not recognize him. And he appeared to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias in John chapter 21. I think there they mistook him for an old man, you know, begging for fish. And well, that man apparently even cooked for them, <laughs> cooked breakfast for them. But so what does that mean he resurrected? Because he could, he could appear and disappear. And yet they could touch him like a physical body, as Mary Magdalene and the other women did. In John 20, verse 17, uh, Mary Magdalene touched him. In Matthew 28, verse 9, the other women touched him also. And the disciples in the upper room, and also the most funny character in the story of, the, uh, of Easter is Thomas, who said, unless I see him with my own eyes, unless I touch you know, the marks of the wound on his hands and on his side, I will not believe. And when Jesus appeared to him, he said, Thomas, come here, touch me. And he did. And then when he touched him, he said, my Lord and my God. And, well, in Luke 24, 41 to 42, he even asked for food because they were shocked. They thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said, no, no, I am not a ghost. Come, come close, you know, and see. I have a body. You know, we have food. I think pinatawa pa niya sila by saying, may makakain ba tayo dyan? Maybe he was really that kind of a character, you know. Pag nagutom, he said, nagahanap ng pagkain. Well, what, what does this mean? Well, John saw, and what he saw guided his faith. He took it as a sign, and then it led him to believe, only faith can actually make us understand what we are seeing, like the beloved disciple who saw and believed. 
But many people nowadays would say to see is to believe, meaning the seeing is a condition for the believing. Well, after Thomas, after Thomas said, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Ah, now, now you, you believe because you've seen me. How blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet they have believed. Again, he's talking about us now. Our situation in which faith leads us to seeing, to believe is to see. St. Paul seemed to have picked up from that line about John the beloved disciple who saw and believed. Because now he would meditate on the real meaning of resurrection and he will expound on what he believes about what being raised from the dead really means. That it is not just about an actual dead physical body or cadaver being raised back to the same physical life or the same mortal life. It is not like that. It's not going to be more of the same. It's no longer about the same body bounded by time and space. It is rather about a totally, totally new kind of body that transcends physicality or corporeality. It transcends time and space. That is why, you know, he could enter through locked doors. In Romans 6 verse 9, St. Paul says, we know that Christ, raised from the dead, will die no more. Death has no longer any power over him. Okay, that distinguishes resurrection from resuscitation. Death will no longer have power over us. And so, in chapter 15 of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, you might want to read, what I consider the best and the most elaborate reflection of St. Paul on the meaning of resurrection and eternal life. There the apostle declares, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching too is empty, and so is our faith. Meaning, resurrection is fundamental. It is foundational for our faith, our Christian faith. And then St. Paul proceeds to Discuss, he says, how will the dead be raised? And with what kind of body will they come back? He asks that question in verse 35. And you know, he seems to be echoing the prophet Daniel in chapter 12, verse 3. Remember what I quoted a while ago, verse 3 of chapter 12, that's speaking about the, the, the resurrection. Uh, you know, those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And in verse 3, the wise will shine brightly like the splendor of the firmament. And those who have led many to righteousness shall be like the stars. Like the stars. And I think, you know, this has sort of stirred up the imagination of St. Paul. Because he's also speaking about those who will resurrect as, you know, celestial bodies like the stars. And they have to be distinguished from earthly bodies, he says like star differing from star in its brightness. And he mentions that in verse 41 of 1 Corinthians 15. And then in verses 42 to 44 of the same chapter, he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. What is sown corruptible is raised incorruptible. What is sown dishonorable is raised glorious. What is sown weak is raised powerful. What is sown a natural body is raised into a spiritual body. So he's talking about a different kind of body altogether. And in verse 52, he says, The dead will be raised incorruptible. And when that happens, we shall be transformed. Ah, so Paul is talking about, you know, a transformation. And in verse 54, he declares, and when that which is corruptible clothes itself with incorruptibility and that which is mortal with immortality, then the word that is written shall come about. A prophecy for him. Death is swallowed up in victory. And then, ang hamon niya, you know, sa kamatayan, where now, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? 
Remember, you know, in Jewish theology, death is a consequence of sin. We, can no long, we cannot avoid it as far as they're concerned. But now, resurrection will say, tapos na ang sumpa. Because isang sumpa, ang kamatayan ng tao, bunga ito ng pagkakasala. But then, of course, through the redeeming passion and death of Christ, then we also have a hope of the resurrection. Because we believe that we are image and likeness of God, called to be sons and daughters of God, we journey through life searching for that which endures beyond the grave. It's, it's the most natural thing for us, you know, to desire eternal life, even if it is so clear to us that we're living a mortal life. It, you know, at the outset, it sounds unrealistic, you know. It sounds like, you know, fantasy. But, uh, well, sometimes it's true. We are tempted to despair, you know, like those St. Paul is talking about in his first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 13. And there, in verse 13, St. Paul says, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, about those who have fallen asleep. And he's talking about those who have died ahead, you know. Kasi mukhang nakakamatay na yung members of the Thessalonian community. And Paul had already spoken to them about the resurrection. And, you know, they were beginning to despair na mauunahan sila, you know na uunahan nila yung mga namatay because they will not be alive at that moment of that resurrection that Paul is talking about. So they're grieving. But Paul says, okay, you grieve. But you should not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Do not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Kung naalala niyo, I mentioned this to you yesterday. When we reflected on the journey through death and we spoke I spoke to you about the positive meaning of grieving according to Carlo Rovelli. That, well, actually grieving is not so negative because only people who have genuinely loved can grieve in a manner that is hopeful. The grief will not destroy them. I wish to end this reflection now with a poem I composed several years ago using the analogy of a butterfly's metamorphosis to describe our passage to eternal life. Of course, that's the reason kung bakit pinamagatan ko ito na paru-paro. Ang paru-paro. Those of you who do not understand English, uh, Tagalog very well, well, please just read the subtitles in English. And here is the poem. Ang paru-paro. Wow. Alam kaya ng higad? na siya'y magiging paru-paro. Alam kaya ng buto ng bayabas na siya'y magiging punong kahoy? Alam kaya ng sisiw sa itlog na siya'y magiging agila? Alam kaya ng sanggol sa sinapupunan na siya'y magiging tao? Sa totoo lang, hindi naman lahat ng higad nagiging paru-paro. Ang iba ay nagiging pagkain lang ng mga gagamba. Hindi naman lahat ng buto ng bayabas ay nagiging punong kahoy. Ang iba ay nabubulok lang kasama ng ipot. Hindi lahat ng sisiw sa idlog ay nagiging ibon. Ang iba ay nabubugok at ang iba ay nagiging balot. Hindi lahat ng sanggol sa sinapupunan ay nagiging tao. Ang iba ay nakukunan at ang iba ay kusang nilalaglag. Ano kaya ang damdamin ng higad? na nakatulog ng mahimbing at may pakpak na ng magising. Ano kaya ang damdamin ng buto ng bayabas na nalibing at nang bumangon ay sariwang dahon ang kanyang mga bisig? Ano kaya ang damdamin ng sisiw sa nabasag na itlog at nakasilip sa naghihintay na inahin? Ano kaya ang damdamin ng sanggol na namilipit sa madilim na yungib, lumabas na padulas at nakaaminag ng liwanag sa labas. Ang libingang walang laman ay parang sapot na walang higat. Parang balat ng butong nakawala at tumubong binhi. Parang basag na itlog na wala ng sisiw. Parang pusod na napatid sa palaanakan. 
Bakit ba hinahanap mo ang higad sa nakasabit na pinagbalutan? Tumingala ka at makikita mo ang makulay na paru-paro. Bakit ba hinahanap mo sa lupa ang laman ng butong nalibing? Tumingala ka at makikita mo ang isang matayog na punong kakoy. Bakit hinahanap mo ang sisiw sa nagkalat na balat ng itlog? Tumingala ka at makikita mo ang lumilipad na agila. Bakit hinahanap mo ang sanggol na napatid sa palaanakan? Tumingala ka at makikita mo ang isang bagong tao. Ah, hindi pala dapat katakutan ng sakit at kamatayan. Ang dapat palang katakutan ay ang pagkabulok, pagkabugok o pagkakunan. Ang pag-iral dito sa mundo ay laging may hiwagang taglay. Kaya pagmasdan, limiin, pagnilayan upang matuklasan na may dusat kamatayan palang nagbabadya ng panibagong buhay sa mga marunong maghintay ng tamang oras, ng tamang araw, ng tamang kabuwanan. Na meron palang kamay na nakaabang at sasalo sa labas ng sinapupunan upang ang bagong silang na sanggol ay may handa sa mas ganap na buhay sa kabila, sa pag-iral na masigit pang di hamak, higit na makulay, at higit na mabunga, higit na matayog, at higit na marangal. Kaya, bangon na, mga anak ng tao. Bangon na sa bagong buhay na nakalaan para sa mga anak ng Diyos. Maligayang Paskong pagkabuhay po sa inyong lahat. Happy Easter to all of you. This is Bishop Ambo David, Bishop of the Diocese of Caloocan. Thank you.